1730 hours on April 4th, 2004, Sadr City of Baghdad, Iraq. Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar. First platoon, Charlie 25 Cav, was escorting a sewage truck in the southern part of the city. Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar. Seventeen fifty five hours as the sun began to set. Three large groups of men scattered to the north as the patrol approached. Everyone in the patrol began to scan their sectors. The city of over two million people grew eerily quiet. And then... What started as sporadic gunfire quickly became overwhelming from all directions. Enemy forces across the city called to arms by the echoing calls of prayer, bouncing from one minaret to the next. This sparked a chain reaction that threw the 1st Brigade Combat Team, 1st Cav Division, headlong into the battle we now call Black Sunday. I am your host, Eddie Lazary, and on this series of episodes, I will be talking to the troops who were there and their families. We will be following and discussing The Long Road Home, a seven-part miniseries in the National Geographic Channel. If you or someone you know served during the Battle of Sadr City, I want to talk to you. Join us over to our closed Facebook group, 04-04-04. Now let's meet our next guest. Yeah, I mean, I, I started off, uh, it's funny, I never really thought of myself as that term, child actor, at the time. Uh, I, I was just kind of doing something that I love to do because I started in theater. So I naturally, from a very young age, I was like five, about five when I started um, in theater with my brothers and sisters. And so I naturally, from a very young age, I wanted to do acting and perform and make people laugh or whatever uh and and i didn't really at the time think of it as a career it was kind of just something i really loved to do this is joey luthman he plays specialist jonathan rydell on national geographic's miniseries the long road home joey started his professional acting career in 2007 when he was just nine years old on april 4th 2004 joey was only six years old you might recognize Joey in 2008's Private Practice. 2009, he starred in iCarly. 2010, Ghost Whisperer and The Forgotten. In 2013, Joey also made appearances in Criminal Minds, Grey's Anatomy, and in 2014, Modern Family. He continued in 2016 with appearances in General Hospital, Hawaii Five-0, and Chicago Med. Joey, an actor in his 20s, has been a part of many television series. Joey's been nominated for the Young Artists Award in 2009, 2010, 11, and 2012. In 2009 and 10, he won the Young Artists Award. And then coming into Hollywood and doing TV and film, and uh, a lot of that was stuff that I already knew how to do or stuff that I learned to do because it's different from theater. Um, and so it was just it was just fun. It was all fun. Uh, and, and that's why it's funny when people say you were a child actor, how are you now? Because 
I never really saw myself as that thing because that, I, I guess it doesn't have to, but whenever you say child actor, it kind of just in, instantly has a, a negative response. Um, you know, oh, you're a child actor, which means you probably grew up to be a really weird person. Um, <laughs> but but no, I mean, I, I think that it was sort of a seamless transition in a lot of ways. Uh, as I got older, I just matured and and I was naturally auditioning for parts that were sort of fitting my personality as I went. Um, and it was, I mean, I, I'd been doing dramatic work when I was younger too, but it was definitely more comedic and, I mean, it was dramatic as well, but I think, yeah, like now I'm doing Long Road Home, which has a much bigger dramatic approach to my acting that I've never done before. Um, so yeah, I, it was, it all feels very seamless and, um, and it kind of just one thing led to another. And I definitely see myself now very differently than when I was younger, but yeah, it wasn't too hard for me. Um, I feel like to make that, that transition and yeah, with long road home, I've never, I've never done anything that was military before. Um, and, uh, but this was a very interesting experience, very learning experience as well uh, for me because I've, I've never, you know, learned this much about the military. I, I, I should have just on my own, but I never looked it up. I never was interested in saying, OK, well, let's learn all about the military today and what they do. Um, and so this was a really good opportunity to learn all about the military or as much as I could learn in the time given uh, and to uh, portray characters that either lost their lives or made sacrifices in a very tragic uh, day um, uh, at one day out of many tragic days. But yeah, so uh, it, it's, it's been a really interesting uh, journey doing this versus the, the other things that I've done on like Nickelodeon and Disney. Um, but it, I've always, I, I've had a lot of fun with it and I couldn't have done it if, if it wasn't for the other cast members. Cause we're all, I mean, we're all a bunch of brothers. So yeah. we, we all bonded really well and, uh, we kind of were looking out for one another on set. So, yeah, yeah. that's yeah. very cool. Now, was this a, was this a role that you kind of sought out, heard about, or, or were you approached for this role? Well, it was uh, an audition like any other. Uh, my, my agent contacts me about uh, an audition that they submitted me for. And um, and then I, I – for this one in particular, I sent in a tape, a, a self-tape. And then the producers and directors and writers would take a look at it uh, and then decide from there. And I only had the one audition on tape. Um, which was really interesting. That hardly ever happens. But I sent it in, and they knew they wanted me for one of the roles, either Rydell or Hayhurst. I went out for Rydell, um, but they 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 figured Rydell would be perfect because I have a, a such a baby looking baby face. <laughs> mm. um, but and and he's like the younger looking one of the young guys. Um, so. Yeah, it went right from that self tape uh, to six months later, call, giving getting a call saying that they wanted me to start filming in April, which was pretty cool. So um, it was it was very slow, and a, a lot of stuff was happening behind the scenes that I didn't know about. So I was just kind of sitting there doing other things, and months later, I finally hear something. But a lot of a lot of work went into. Uh, you know, they, they were dealing with finding locations and getting their other actors. And, and so they, they were finalizing everything. So I, I completely forgot about it. So when they, when they said, Hey, you have, you're, you're, we want to see if you're available for the long road home. I'm like, what's that? <laughs> it's pretty fun. Cause I, I did the audition months ago. I was like, I don't even remember what that was. Um, but yeah, no, it, it's, uh, it's been a great process. Yeah. So did you, um, now, and again, this is more towards kind of some actors like you, obviously mm. at this point, you knew you got the role and you probably were, were told that there was a book written about it. Now, is this yeah. the kind of thing where you you write you you read the book before you go into it to try to portray as close as you can, or do you intentionally not read the book going into this role to try to uh, bring out something new? Do you know what I mean? 
Yeah, well, definitely it was it was kind of like uh, not on the fly, but it was like right when we got there, we were I, I mean, I at least was catching up because I was filming Chicago Med right before that, um, like like weeks before I had to be in uh, in Texas. So I I was on set in wash in, in Chicago so I had very little time to read it but they gave us a, I was reading it online and then they gave us a copy in person and so I was able to read it uh, during the couple weeks of boot camp that we were doing so um, but that yeah I mean I I would say I would say for me at least um, it was it was kind of interesting to not read it at first, uh, and that not read all of it at first, and then go right into it. But um, because that gave you me my own perspective on it, and then reading the book to get the actual you know point of views of the soldiers and and the real things that happened, and you know black and white everything that happened that day was uh, puts that into perspective of what my character's thinking in these different moments. Um, so. Yeah, I, I, I sort of had a mix of the two of not reading it and then reading it. Um, but it I definitely did help to read it so that I know what's going on to put myself in the in the moment of the day. Yeah. Yeah, so thought you kinda of touched on it briefly about the uh, the boot camp that they had you go through, and, and I just have yeah. I have to preface that we we recently had da- Dale Die on. I'm sure you're familiar with Dale Die. Mm-hmm. Um, we had him on for a uh, for an interview for a, a totally separate project that we're working on uh, that has to do with the series Band of Brothers, and that's kind of mm-hmm. that's what Dale died. That's kind of how he started in Hollywood. Was um, he he uh, in the movie Platoon? He got the the mm-hmm. um, the actors basically in you know the hills and and um one of the jungles back, back over there in the in the yeah. in, in the east but um so we got him like into the jungles and like put him through essentially like this boot camp to try to yeah. get them to to kind of gel together and and understand what being in the suck was like and what yeah. what was your experience like i'm sure all the all the boot camp stuff was done there on hood right oh absolutely yeah. it was all done there right on on base we actually did it um we we would wake up or you know around seven every morning and go to set uh and i mean that's late in terms of if i was actually in a boot camp it'd be much earlier much more grueling but uh i mean we're thespians as the uh, (laughs) the rangers referred to us right we're we're the thespians on set but um but yeah no we we would go to the military had already had um buildings that they made for training purposes and then we had our our set right next to it and they sort of intertwined with each other um and we would go to the one that the military had made previous to us shooting uh, and that's where we would clear buildings and learn how to change a mag quickly and uh, just you know not flagging your buddy just simple things like that that we uh, have never really been a part of before so we it's common sense things but we didn't think about them before uh, and so it was just a lot of a lot of that that was something that our our uh, one of our main military advisors, uh, Ranger Mike Baumgarten, who would make sure we didn't look scared of the weapon and that we were comfortable holding a rifle and and you know knowing how to pull cover for you know pull, you know your sector, uh, and so uh, basically that was the majority of it. Um, what was also <laughs> sort of jarring at first was I. I we did a lot of mag changes and things outside with no ammunition. And then finally, uh, in our second week, we were using blank rounds. And so I had never fired a gun before. So this was quite an interesting experience as we were going into a room and we had a big target on the corner, the far corner, and we're supposed to clear it and take out the target. And I remember the first time I go into the room and I'm firing it and I just, it wasn't a big kickback. I mean, but it, it was just like the, the vibration and just the, the noise. We had earplugs, but I mean, just like the, the muffled sound of it all and, and just the heat of the gun. I was like, well, <laughs> it was just a really quick moment. But that, that put me into the character really fast. Uh, that, that put me into the moment of what we're doing. Um, 
which they made us they made it very clear. Uh, Mike told us day one uh, that these are real guys. You're telling stories of real guys who are there, and this is very important for the families and for other people to know about what really happened. Um, and so it's it's a really serious thing. We can't you know mess around. This is this is real people's lives. Um, and it's it's sacred. We have to be respectful. So from that moment on, I I only treated it as such. I, I was we were all very respectful, but I I saw it that way um, from then on. I mean, I always saw it that way. But when Mike told us that who he has served in Iraq and Afghanistan that that the this is a real soldier telling us about something that uh, is really dear to him, and he knows people that were there. I mean, it's it's very real. Uh, this isn't, you know, make believe stuff. So yeah, the boot camp really got us into, into shape, I guess. Uh, but it, it really showed us, uh, a small percentage of what training is like. Cause I mean, if we were actually doing it, it'd be a lot more crawling through the mud and a lot, th- a lot more push ups and six months of that. Um, but, but yeah, no, it, it was great as actors to do that because I, I it would have been, wrong to just put us in the Humvees and strap, you know, vests on us and then, and then go into it. I mean, it, it would, it would be wrong because we wouldn't really know what we're doing. We had a very, a much better idea of what we were doing. Even if, even though it was only two weeks, it was enough to, uh, to get us a push into the right direction. And along the way we were being corrected and advised um, you know, tweaks here and there by our, uh, military advisors, our Rangers. But, uh, yeah, no, it, it was, uh, it was, it was fun. It was a fun and stressful and hardworking two weeks of, uh, of our boot camp. <laughs> yeah. So were, were some of those corrections, did they seem at the time like petty or little or why, why such the big deal? And then uh, learn later why that was so important? A couple a couple times, yeah. Like, well, like if I was, um, no, it, it is is definitely the case. I there was a couple times where I thought, man, why? It's like I'm, I'm just holding the rifle a certain way because it was more comfortable, and I'm like, well, why? Oh, come on, like it's it's I my 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 fingers hurt. Why can't I just hold it like this? And um, but Jericho, one of our other advisors, he was like, no, always hold it like this. And and the reason being, you're you're you got to be always at the ready. Even though we weren't filming, even though it was just off camera, uh, it, it's always something to be a good habit for. Uh, to get a good habit in is is to hold it a certain way, um, and it's so you're always at the ready. And it's it helped when we were on camera to have that habit. I, I there were only a couple times where I was corrected. And then after that, they didn't have to say anything else because I knew I was either doing it wrong or I was already doing it right. Uh, because they had ingrained that into us so many times, uh, burned it into our minds that, you know, this is how it has to be because this is what soldiers do. So that's how it has to be. Yeah. So <laughs> when, you, when you're dealing with military advisors versus a regular, um, like a director for a, a regular set, is it the same level of candidness, or are the military guys a little more uh, more direct with you, or well, what was that feedback like? It definitely depends on the director, I would say. But the 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 military guy, I mean, they I think they they warmed up uh, eventually. I think it was very um, very direct at first. Uh, just making sure we knew the terminology and we knew where to stand and how to hold the weapon and just, you know, directions. Uh, but as it went along, they became looser with us and, and, uh, and we, we all kind of knew each other better as the shoot went on. So that just naturally sort of, um, loosened up a little bit. It was still very, you know, direct in, in, you know, telling and correcting us and, certain ways, but we were looser with each other and, and definitely with directors, it, it's the same thing. Uh, our two directors, um, Mikhail Solomon and, uh, Phil Abraham, uh, both of them, we, we sort of, we had to create this relationship very quickly. Um, they had been planning it and now we're in it. And so they had a lot more time to, to, to work with everything that they, 
uh, like the set and whatnot and, and the scripts uh, further ahead of time than all the actors did. So we sort of were having to create the relationships with them very quickly um, on our first several days of filming. Uh, but after the first initial couple of weeks with both of them, it was definitely uh, not as uh, stiff, I guess, because it, it, we, we knew each other more and we could talk with each other like friends and, and you know, it was more conversational. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, And so, yeah, so definitely on both sides, on the military side and on the uh, Hollywood side on the director side, both time, you know, it was just building that relationship. And then, uh, and then it was, uh, it was pretty casual. Yeah. yeah. Did you know any of the other actors prior to coming into this? I actually, uh, no, I didn't. Uh, I met, I met all of them except I was very close to meeting. Actually, I, I technically I did. Yes. I met all of them on set, um, for the first time, but I have, uh, I was very close to meeting Roll, Roland Buck, uh, who, which is funny because he is also a recurring uh, regular on Chicago Med, and he was in the episode that I was in, but in a different section. So I never crossed paths with him, mm. but he was also in Chicago shooting at the same time, but I never met him. So uh, it was funny when we did boot camp, and he said, why do you look so familiar? And then I talked about my character in Chicago Med. He's like, oh my God, <laughs> I was in that episode. Um, so yeah, so I, uh, other than that, no, I hadn't met anyone else before, which uh, was pretty cool. We all were, and, and that was kind of the same thing for a lot of us. Uh, I, only a few of us knew each other um, in uh, a, a couple guys who, were, who did theater together in New York um, beforehand, but most of us, yeah, we did know any one of each other. Yeah. yeah. So I know uh, me being a veteran and obviously uh, veterans in general always look at uh, war movies, whether they're based off of real events or otherwise very critically. And then, in, yeah. and then in, in, in particular veterans like myself that actually served on the ground during the time mm -hmm. that you guys are portraying the story. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think there's a whole nother level or element of, of um, I don't know, uh, critiquing, I guess. Yeah. Um, I think you guys have really done a good job. Now, obviously, we haven't gone through the entire uh, series yet, um, but, right. but what we've seen so far has just been an incredible depiction of what happened there. Um, mm -hmm. The language, I mean, obviously, we are we pick up the stuff like, you know, walking and carrying the weapon and the, and the language that's being used. Um, the, the big big giveaway of people that uh, aren't familiar with the military is the language. There's almost yeah. a totally separate uh, code or, or way that we yeah. talk, mannerisms, words that don't make sense outside the military, you know, mean everything mm -hmm. when you're inside. And, and you guys did a really good job of kind of capturing uh, uh, that as well. And I don't know, was that just yeah. – was that taught to you guys or was that just through the course of just being around these guys enough? It was both. Uh, a lot of it was scripted, but a lot of it was a lot of it made sense, even though it was scripted. When it was scripted, um, and we first read it, uh, either before boot camp or, you know, during boot camp, uh, it it kind of felt weird saying some of these some of this jargon that, you know, we wouldn't say otherwise. Um, and uh, it's all very military, and and it's like I, it's like I wouldn't say that, um, but it it became natural uh, over time and very quickly though. But I mean, yeah, it it was, um, yeah, it felt unnatural at first, and then we sort of grew into it. And what's interesting is a lot of it was sort of a foreign language, but a lot of it wasn't too. Uh, that's what Mike, our um, Mike Baumgarten, who uh, was telling us that if you get too caught up in trying to say, all right, you know, Alpha, go take the, the you know, the Niner and the, like some weird random like words that don't need to be said. It's like, what, what are you saying? Like, talk to me like a human being. Um, so that that was it, too, is being direct and and making sense. Uh, and so some of the terminology is stuff that we we wouldn't use normally or would rarely use but some of it is stuff that is just common sense uh and things that you know you're trying to get a, something across to someone very quickly so you'd say it like this it just makes sense mm -hmm. so it's about a mixture of common sense and uh foreign <laughs> is there is there any phrases that you catch yourself saying after 
<laughs> nowadays. I mean, I mean, uh, I mean, a lot of a lot of copy that. I say copy that all the time now. <laughs> copy I say that. I say it all the time. EJ, who is our lieutenant, uh, Guero, he um, yeah, he says that all the time. I think he, I think that r- rubs off on me too. Uh, whenever anyone says so, like, all right, copy that. I said it, text it to people all the time. Uh, yeah, so I say, I say that more often than I think I ever did before. Yeah, now. that's funny. Yeah. That's pretty funny. So yeah. the um, so one of the things that I that I picked up on that I really enjoyed. Um, and those that served in combat knows exactly what I'm talking about. It's this, it's this weird moment where you're literally on the precipice of dying and it's scary as hell. And you still have like, like bullets are flying everywhere. Bomb shit's going everywhere, but Mm. you still have this weird sense of humor with your, the guys that you're with. And yeah. you're telling stories and things yeah. are just funny when they shouldn't be funny. Things that are supposed yeah. to be serious just aren't at the time. Um, you guys yeah. capture that really well uh, on, a, on a few of the scenes. Um, yeah. And I, I remember it was, uh, was it last week's episode with Garza. Um, I think it was Garza. Yeah. And, uh, who was with and him? Arciago was with him. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, they were pulling. Their stuff's so great. <laughs> they yeah. were pulling security. And they were just going back and forth uh, uh, about the song that the, yes, he sang yes, for his proposal. Yes. And they're like, hey, man, sing a little yeah, bit. Yeah, exactly. Like, what you That's a great song. What you yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love that stuff. That was that really, It really brings out the human yeah. uh, side of it because, yeah, you, you'd think that, oh, it's all serious all the time and it's so dramatic and so scary. And, and yeah, it is. But, I mean, it's just kind of, yeah, you just, there's this sense of humor that – shouldn't really be there it's inappropriate humor but it it, i mean it's real it's also human it's natural yes no was that was that scripted or was that something those two kind of did a lot of that a lot of that was they bring out their their natural personality but a lot of it was scripted yeah yeah. um which is great which is it just shows that miko our writer really did um his research i mean he talked to a lot of soldiers and and that's a lot of the stuff they said which it's unfortunate because there was you know in uh, matt fisk's book uh black Sun, um oh god black knight's dark days uh or i might be mixing that up i always mix that up i've seen the title so many times um but he, in his book he you know he talks about firsthand how a lot of the guys were were joking around and it I mean, just in laughing at things that they shouldn't be laughing at. And, uh, yeah, there was a lot of that. And we wanted to show more of that, but there was so much to show. Yeah. Uh, and it's all very much real time. So there's, like, a lot of places to cover, um, whether it be Captain Denemy or or over with uh, uh, Arciaga and Garza. I mean, it's, like, like, so many things happening all at the same time that they couldn't show all of it, but... Yeah, we, we tried to get um, a little bit in there, uh, and so it yeah we we show that pretty well I think yeah that's really cool <laughs> yeah I, I love it I love those those real moments because I've had many of those real life in my deployment there and I know anybody that served in in, in combat in any of these mm-hmm. deployments whether it's Iraq or Afghanistan like they they've been there done that and uh, it's it's one of those things that kind of you, you got to find ways to kind of ground yourself and, and mm-hmm. you've got all these I- emotions that are kind of in you and you've got to try to release them in some way and not set. It's, it's very, it's also almost like running into a theater and yelling fire, right? It, right. People can just immediately turn into this panic mode and mm-hmm. you got to try to keep your guys kind of on this level playing field yeah. and keeping their head in the game. And, and f- yeah. fear is, fear is contagious. I mean, you could still be afraid. Yeah. You're, you are afraid. Everybody's scared to death. Um, yeah. but to show that it, it just kind of breeds and festers and it can get really ugly really quickly. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that your character started off really early on was, I don't know if you're familiar with the term moral injury. Uh, a little, yeah, a little. So in, in, in your character, so you, you know, you, you, uh, you take a bead down on this kid, right? Um, mm-hmm. a combatant that was, you know, essentially a child. Um, uh, mm-hmm. we see more of that as the series progresses, especially last week when they were given the order basically to, to open up on the, on the crowds. They were, you know, human shields, um, mm-hmm. with women and children. And this, this idea mm-hmm. of moral injury is that, you're you're forced to to or you're put into a position 
that conflicts with your morality in your your morals, your beliefs, your humanity. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it really plays a part on the human psyche and the soldiers that are put mm -hmm. in those positions, whether it's, you know, taking out a, a, a you know, a combatant that's also a child or or yeah. having to shoot through human shields or um, yeah. many, many different um, forms of these experiences that we've all had. And it, it leaves us when we redeploy and we come back to the United States, um, it messes with us in a lot of ways because... Um, because you learn what, what humanity, you learn what humans are capable of doing to other humans. Yeah. And, and I think you saw that through this story, um, in, in everything that you've experienced in, in the script and the book, um, talk mm -hmm. to me a little bit about kind of being in that situation, not in real life, but playing those characters you were able mm -hmm. to bring some of that out uh, in in your characters in that story. I don't know whether you realized you did or not, but you did. <laughs> yeah, I, I uh, that's that's definitely something that uh, a note that that people have said that I I did really well was shown that that innocence and uh, and shown that it, very quickly it was taken away, um, and I think that it's. It, it was difficult, but also not very difficult for me to uh, put myself there in that place because uh, me and me and Rydell in uh, in this we were very similar. Uh, come from you know Oregon, uh, but I I come from Ohio, but you know it smaller town backgrounds essentially, um, and so neither of us have seen battle, uh, which is true, and and now we're we're in it, and so it's. Even though, you know, in in reality, I would have had months and months of of training, uh, but it's the same idea. I've never been shot at with, you know, real bullets getting like right past my head and and having to kill someone, and you know that that whole concept. It's like I've I've shot at targets. It's like I never shot at an actual like person. Um, so that was not hard for me to uh to to put myself there uh and i i kind of just yeah i for me i just put my you know what if i was doing that and and i think that's what read on the camera is that i lost that innocence it was kind of like what if i you know me joey lost that innocence and so it was not too much uh, of a stretch for me for the camera to see that those emotions were were there uh, the, in in the way that I just reacted to it uh, naturally, um, which uh, which I I would imagine is definitely what a lot of soldiers go through in different degrees of how they show it, um, and uh, because there's always that first kill um, and it could be quick or it could be you know in the case on the show for me I. I had that one and it was it was just a kid and they used their kid and and so it's just so many conflicting emotions and now I have to kill it's like so it could be really fast or it could be slow and and intense like that it's always intense but yeah so it, it was not too difficult for me to to put myself there um, because the set itself was so realistic that I mean, we were in the uniforms. We we held the heavy rifles. We were on top of a rooftop that looked exactly like the same rooftop that these soldiers were on. So, yeah, all of that played, um, and that's I think I, I give credit to so many other things because I didn't have to try too hard, um, and it was just real at that point. Yeah, man. And you you briefly talked about. You know the the soldiers that you were representing and the family members and in I think it was your your uh, your training NCO that was talking about um, you know honoring those that served and, and this is kind of mm -hmm. a real deal and a couple of episodes uh, prior to the one we're on I interviewed um, Robert Arciaga's mother Sylvia mm -hmm. and we talked mm -hmm. and we and she shared her story about. Uh, about Robert and her youngest son, Jeremy. And for those that, mm -hmm. that are listening to this and haven't listened to that, I highly recommend you go back uh, and listen to that episode. Um, but, you know, and, and 
you guys are not only playing a part on screen, but you're you're telling a story. You're telling a story of real yeah. real soldiers that were there, the real loss, the real sacrifice, and the real mm -hmm. innocence that's being lost. Um, did you have a chance to meet? I know you met some of the other guys that served there, but any of the uh, family members of those that that were lost uh, there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we we uh, I, I know that uh, Ian Quinlan who. Uh, was um, was definitely very close with the uh, the Garzas and the Arciagas. Um, I, I mean, yeah, it, it was uh, it was very uh, sobering, I guess, to uh, to to meet them, uh, the, the families, uh, and so uh, and and the Youngs as well. Uh, so yeah, we we they were on set every now and then. Um, sometimes we didn't cross paths because they were visiting people on a, another part of set or they weren't there on that day but whenever we did see them it was you know we would always tell them we were very uh appreciating of their support because they uh, they let us tell this story um and and we're so grateful for that because we think that the world should know about their uh their sons that took their that were lost uh in in this horrific day so we were very, you know, very thankful for everything that they said. Uh, they, they were grateful for us. We were grateful for them. And uh, that was a great experience. We didn't get to see them all the time. But, yeah, whenever we did, it was uh, it was always very nice. Yeah, man. So what was something that you kind of learned or, or a takeaway from this experience that you totally didn't expect going into it? Um, I didn't expect to... Well, I mean, I guess I guess I kind of did, but I didn't uh, anticipate having this much of an appreciation for the military. Uh, I, I mean, I already did, and I'm very grateful and for everything that they've done for all the men and women that lost their lives throughout the years. But I, doing this, I thought, I think beforehand, I thought that you know this would be a great learning experience, but I didn't know how much I would really take away from it, um, and I and I know I would really be you know, in the moment and I would, I would learn, uh, everything I, that I could and, uh, make it look as believable as possible. But yeah, I didn't expect to have this much of appreciation because they, they really, I mean, clearing, that was something too, is, is when we were in training and we were clearing rooms and, and you, we, I mean, the, the, our military advised the two Rangers that were Mike and Jericho that were helping us, they would show us how fast they had to be to go in and clear it and be like, like within a second, they cleared the room and, and that was it. Um, and they were so tight with each other and it's like, geez, like they, they were breaking it down for us. Like, you know, if you, if you're a second late, the guy coming in is like, a, like a half a second late, then he won't be behind his other guy. And then he'll be the one that's shot coming through the door. Or if your second guy's not coming in fast enough, then he can't cover because he can see him. It's like, they, they have so much to think about and and they're doing it all for the sake of our our freedom and the sake of us living here civilians in in the United States and it's incredible how much they sacrifice and and what they put themselves in uh, just for I mean for us uh, and so I have a, a even greater appreciation that I didn't expect to have when I went into it. Absolutely. So you'll never play call of duty the same again, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, it's, it's, yeah. <laughs> I mean, they, they say a lot of the same things. And so it's like, okay. I mean, yeah, I mean, it, oh, well, that was something too. That was something too, that on, I think it was day one. Actually it was day one when we were doing mag changes, Mike made it clear. He hold up a mag. He was like, this is called a magazine, not a clip. This is not a video game. This is called a mag. <laughs> So yeah, that that was uh, <laughs> just kind of getting us into the mindset. But yeah, no, I will never play, never play it the same again. <laughs> Change for <forever>. no. <laughs> uh, you, yeah, you're with your buddies online. You're like, dude, you so didn't have my back on that clearing there, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? What was that? Come on, you gotta be with, you gotta be on top. Yeah, of you. come on. Uh, yeah, that's funny. Uh, yeah, and yeah, man. So. Uh, <laughs> you, you still you stay in contact with any of the uh, uh, any of the other actors are probably, you know, busy on other things. But 
Absolutely. We all, we all stay in contact. That was something that we, we started doing like group texts with each other, but it ended up being too convoluted because some people had iPhones, some people had Android, some people had Windows phones, and it was just like not like really quick communication. So we ended up getting um, a group chat set up on a, a, an app called WhatsApp, and, and it just was really convenient for all of us to uh, stay together. And we still do. I mean, we all talk to each other. Um, I see what uh, we we're all I mean, we're all over the place. Some people are st- like a- Alex moved here, um, but I know EJ and Ian and Darius, they're all in New York still. And Josh, who is our Aust- Australian friend, putting on his American accent for the show, he is uh, back in Australia right now. And we still talk with him and we're all good buddies still. It's great. And, and that was something that I was afraid we were going to lose. I'm, I still like to stay in contact with everyone, but I was afraid we would lose that after we stop filming but we're all still we're all still talking yeah. like a lot so it's it's great i'm i'm glad that we're all in uh, in close communication still yeah that's really cool and i highly recommend it. do everything you can not to lose that cuz it's so easy to slip into doing your own thing and and that's what that's what this series has done for for us is it, it gave us kind of a reason to come back and and it, uh, you can see in that group there's hundreds of pictures and videos that people have taken while they were over there and and yeah. it's just I could yeah. spend like all day long on that group and just looking at th- things <laughs> that I've never seen before. Um, yeah. Everyone has their own stash of of you know stuff that they brought back with them and 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 it's just yeah. cool to really see everybody sharing it and and yeah. uh, and the yeah. fourth was really for those that were there. The 444 was really the start of what ended up being a, a pretty horrific year for us over there. Um, yep. And and that's the thing that I people that were there know, but people that, that weren't there may not know. And that is, you know, 444, it is a story. Long Road Home is a story. It's about, you know, that that battle of Sauter Sea that happened, um, mm-hmm. the, you know, that, that day and the day after. Uh, but it really was the well, you know, it was we, we called it uh, Muktada Al Sadr. We called him Mookie, right? That was that was Mookie's uh, um, coming out party for all of us, right? And uh, mm-hmm. and it was just a, a horrific year after that. And so mm-hmm. having this series come out gave all of us a, a reason, an excuse, if you will, whatever you want to call it, to kind of come back together, share each other's stories, um, mm-hmm. and and there's still a lot of healing that needs to happen. Uh, for a lot of uh, soldiers that were there and for a lot of family Absolutely. members of soldiers that were there. And, and this has been a yeah. way to do that, and that's really, really cool. So I want to say, f- for me personally to you, thank you for for what you did. Yeah, thank um, you. I, I, I know yeah. you probably had no idea what you are getting into going into this. <laughs> um, <laughs> Not, uh, very, very little, yeah. It, it got much bigger as I went along. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So what do you think that this, this is going to do uh, do you think this is going to open up any opportunities for any um, different other kinds of um, acting gigs in the future for you? I definitely hope so. Um, yeah, a lot, a lot of people ask me if I want to, you know, do any more uh, war things, and I said absolutely. I I think uh, this this just opens up. Uh, I think I hopefully opens up an opportunity to do more of that um, because it. I mean, it's fun and it's also very educational, but it's also uh, pretty badass too. So <laughs> I would say that's a big perk, you know? Um, but it's also, it's very informative. So I, I love, uh, it's, it's just so many perks, so many pluses and perks to it. So, uh, yeah, if, if this opens up doors, that'd be amazing. Yeah, man. absolutely. That, um, that Mount site that you were in the, the training buildings you were talking about, that's, yeah. it's on Elijah there on Fort hood, a Mount site, M O U T military operations and urban terrain is what it stands for. And, uh, mm-hmm. that was what we were using, uh, as training before we actually went to uh, Iraq. And so, wow. uh, we used that building. It was the oh. larger building and there's another, um, site, another range, uh, a little bit uh, further over that, that we used mm-hmm. as well. But that was our, our primary training tools to, to kind of learn that that urban operations of urban terrain uh, tactics and and of course mm-hmm. you, you've seen the the concrete structures the mount site that you trained in but then you also saw on set uh, the the Sadr city and how yeah. how different those two were yeah. in terms of the building structure and how things were and and, yeah. and that was one of the challenges is we were going in you know we were training using you know American um, 
you know, building mm-hmm. structures and, and the way that, yeah. you know, the, it was all smooth concrete yeah. and perfect looking. Yeah. 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 And you go into that environment and you got like this courtyard where it's like this weird, weird dead space between like the a metal door yeah. and then the, you know, so it's yeah. very weird structure. I must've looked absolutely surreal to be in the middle of Texas. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you're yeah. in the middle of Sauter city on set. Right. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, we, we, every day we'd come in, uh, go to set and, and suit up. And it was, uh, it, it was a trek too, because they, they recreated all of, uh, all, but most of root Delta and, uh, and the, the alleyway, especially where, you know, the, the human shields coming through and all that stuff happens. So, uh, it, it was a trek to get through 14 acres, I believe all of it. Uh, so yeah, it, it, I mean, <laughs> you're, we're, you're walking onto set and you're just surrounded by all of it. Uh, very surreal, especially when, I mean, that was something that John Beavers, uh, who plays, uh, Eric Berkwin, he, he was saying, well, we were kneeling up there on the roof, covering our sectors in between a take. He said, just imagine what it's going to look like for people to see that we have to imagine this. But what people on at home are going to see is the miles of buildings and buildings and buildings all around us. Mm-hmm. But what we see is Texas. I mean, yeah. we, we, <laughs> the set stops and we see Texas roads and stuff. But, uh, so that was something that we had to really imagine, but it comes across so well because the, I mean, the CGI and the, the special effects is second to none. It was amazing. We had some amazing, um, pyrotechnics and things on set that really put us there and really will put the audience there, uh, now seeing it finished. But yeah, I mean, it, it was, <laughs> it was surreal stepping from, uh, from the car to the, the the grass to then getting onto the dirt and then going into Sutter City. It's like it was all very close together, but it was like very different. Yeah. One after another. Yeah. That so I, I talked to uh, uh Lieutenant uh well he's he's a major now, but Zuniga, uh who was the first episode on the show and he was actually uh, he had an opportunity to go on set. He he was there with us um, he was in Sauter city quite a bit around, uh, police, police station number five. And they, they actually recreated that there on set a little bit smaller scale yeah. than, than he remembers, yeah. but, uh, he goes, they just totally nailed it. He was completely amazed to see it. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. I was like, so I was like, was it, I mean, was it real? He's like, he goes, the only thing that they were missing was the actual smell. Uh, can- that's exactly that's exactly what all the other soldiers said too. Uh, they they all said that it just it doesn't smell like goat crap. I mean, <laughs> yeah. it, it, that was what was missing. <laughs> yeah, uh, and we yeah. I mean, I mean, there you can't get smell through a TV, but you can imagine. Yeah. I mean, I but yeah, no, it it was that was yeah that was what a lot of them said is it was just the smell. Everything else was perfect. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's very cool. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Um, yeah. What? What? So, I, so watching this series come out as it releases, is it? It's is it the first time you're seeing it in full rendered production as well? Yeah, um, it's the first time I'm seeing it, and uh, I saw we saw a very rough cut of the the very first episode um, because the first two episodes aired together, but we saw a rough cut of the first episode at our rap party back in, I think it was like July 2nd or July 3rd. Um, and, uh, and that, that was the, the only thing that I'd seen of it. And it was very rough. A lot of the sound still wasn't mixed correctly. And some of the, some of the cuts weren't, you know, f- you know, fine tuned, but, uh, it, it was a good look at what it was going to be. And, uh, and now seeing everything put together was just incredible. I will say there's a funny moment when I was doing some ADR, uh, voiceover dubbing for my, uh, my, my parts in episode seven, I believe, um, they were showing it, it wasn't put in yet. It was still being finished in another section so they just put in a placeholder of some of the cgi for the helicopters in uh in that episode so in between my lines i just see this gray screen with these like toy looking helicopters just kind of floating there <laughs> awkwardly just hanging looks like by strings and uh and so that was something that kind of threw me off but i can't wait to see what it actually looks like now so so seeing that and now seeing the finished product it's like i can't wait to see what those toy helicopters turn into yeah uh, but yeah i know there was 
a lot of things that we did that really just they either turned out exactly the way I thought it was or better than I thought it was going to look um, now seeing it on TV finished as it's incredible seeing it. I bet you I mean for somebody that wasn't actually in Sutter City to see it portrayed from the roof yeah. from the rooftop looking out at mm -hmm. the the totality of Sutter City now you know yeah. Sutter City from a mileage standpoint like it's like Four miles square, four, you know, whatever it is, yeah. four miles. North. I mean, it's 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 yeah. pretty. But you got two it's, and a half million people live in this thing, right? It's dense, but it's yeah, but it's very tiny. Yeah, yeah. and uh, but when you're in it, man, and uh, yeah, wow. yeah, yeah, it's uh, and yeah. at night too, and it's just uh, yeah, it's because you know at the time most of not just Sutter City but Baghdad and the surrounding cities uh, were without power, didn't have electricity, didn't have running water. Um, and so when, when night came, it, it got dark, man. If the moon, got dark. the moon wasn't yeah. out, it was dark. And, uh, yeah, yeah, so. absolutely. Yeah. That, that was definitely a, um, a factor. We, we did have, there were some light bulbs that were lit on the, on the ground on a, a few of the different houses, um, surrounding, surrounding our rooftop. But other than that is very true is, uh, it was, the moon <laughs> that was yeah. lighting uh, a lot of it so yeah and uh, various fires and things like that but um yeah that is very true yeah, yeah it's one of those things where it's like a, a it's a blessing and the curse right you need the you need the illumination to be able to see the bad guys mm -hmm. uh but if you can see them by illumination that means they can see you too right exactly um, and the and the yeah. platoon at the time you know they they weren't planning on being out all night they didn't have their nvgs and their night vision gear with them yeah um, yep. weren't prepared. I mean, I'm sure they didn't have a lot of food and water available. Um, yeah, yeah. and, uh, you know, but you know, which bullets are flying. You're, that's kind of the last thing you're thinking about. So, yeah. Oh, but yeah. then there's like, how long are we going to be here? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. You know I mean? No, exactly. It became a, a, a game to try to just get as accurate as you can because you only have so many rounds left. It's, yeah. like, it's like you only have so much time before you're black on ammo. Right. Um, and, uh, and I, and I was talking to, um, uh, our Colonel Hyde who was on set with us and, uh, he was, he was also just kind of making sure that, you know, if, if I was looking down sight, my dust cover wasn't, you know, closed or things, simple things yeah. like that, that we don't think about. Right. But, um, yeah, he, he was keeping an eye out, but he, I asked him, I said, it's like, you know, when we were down in that alley, because we shot, I mean, Rel you know, in in real time, it was not a very long amount of time, but in acting time, we shot that scene over the course of three days. Um, oh. And so, when we're like the human shields coming in on both sides, that that was three days of filming, and it was so very painful to hold up a a rifle for twelve hours. So, and and that's I mean that's the reality. But I, I asked uh, Colonel Hyde, I said, is there is there anything that you can tell me, like a technique or something that like how how do guys hold up rifles? I mean, I know they're very much in shape and they're meant, you know, they, they can do that. But like, I know you got to get tired after a while. And uh, he said he said you'd be surprised when you're terrified and the adrenaline is pumping that you'd, you'd be surprised what you can do in those moments you don't even feel it yeah. uh and it's just you just you're just doing it um and so that pushed me through it still hurt but it pushed me through <laughs> those those intense uh days of shooting i hated that i hated those scenes <laughs> after doing that it was so hard uh i sound like such a a, a whiner thespian, but it was very difficult. <laughs> I think anyone can attest to that, that. It was very difficult. Three days of shooting. Um, we're also very glad to be off that roof. Oh my God. That was some intense shooting too. But um, yeah, no, it, it, it's, it was a lot. Uh, so how much time uh, was, how much time did you spend actually filming? What was the, it was, uh, I, we were there for just about three months. Um, there, they had to do a little bit of, they had to do a lot of home front stuff um, before uh, we did all of the 
uh, stuff in Solder City, but altogether it was just just about three months of filming, um, and uh, just about continuous too. I only had maybe a couple weeks in total uh, off mm. uh, altogether, so it was a lot of continuous shooting um, th- for three months. That's yeah. awesome. So you so you got yeah. to really appreciate the Texas heat then. <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah it was it was very humid and very hot Hell yes we were getting to the last month of filming and it was like well last last half of the last month it was like 105 degrees with like stupid humidity i mean it was so great it was it was after the end of every day pretty much we would just be like drenched and we're already drenched from from all the the work we're doing and now we have to go home and just sweat it's like God, it doesn't stop so yeah that was uh something it reminded me of home actually because being in ohio there's high humidity over there uh but it was something i wasn't used to in california there's a lot of dry heat yeah. it's not as heavy uh so when we first got there, that was definitely something I had to get accustomed to was the the weight that you kind of have to walk through. It feels like you're just walking through a cloud or something. It's like it's like it's heavy humidity on you all the time. But um, that was something, too, is the weather. It was like we got the extremes of everything. I mean, for the first month, there were some crazy thunderstorms. Oh, yeah. Every night, I mean, it was almost on cue. It was like around, we would wrap around 5.30 or 6 and go back to uh, our units on base and there was just a crazy thunderstorm. I mean, it was, it was ridiculous, but it was, it was pretty fun too. There were some days where it actually got so bad the night before shooting, we had to postpone uh, the shoot and do other stuff for a couple days because there was mildew growing in all of the sets because these how, these weren't meant to be you know, secure structures. They're meant to, except for the house that we were going in and standing on top of, a lot of these were just like faces, you know, of, of buildings. Right. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, it was, uh, quite the extreme of everything. I, I miss that in California because it's, you don't get all of the ups and downs of the weather all the time. Mm-hmm. So, but yeah, the Texas heat is uh, is definitely something, man. So, so where where were you staying then when you were not filming? Were you staying on, on Fort Hood? We're on Fort Hood, and uh, and man, I, <laughs> I, I mean, it's not like they're scary. I just I got so nervous every time I go into base. I have to show my uh, atonement pass, and it's just like, okay, this this is you know this is me, and and okay, I'm good to go on base. All right, uh, and, and so I, and I had to memorize where to go because I. I didn't. There was this is a maze of houses and things. I had to like look at a map to get to my unit, uh, and uh, yeah. But it was funny too because by the time I memorized where everyone's places were, we were done with shooting. I was like, well, all right, great. <laughs> uh, but yeah, but it was uh, great. I got to drive off base and get groceries and come back. I mean, well, I lived there for three months, yeah. and EJ especially who plays Aguero. He, I mean, it was. I went to his place. We were two weeks into filming after boot camp, and the guy, I mean, he had so many condiments and, and things all over the place. It looked like he'd been living there for, for years. I mean, <laughs> he just made himself at home. Yep. It was great. Um, and so, yeah, we, we just we felt right at home on base. That's yeah. cool. Very cool. What was it like being around? You know, you obviously were there. You probably saw the PT in the morning and the uh, – Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. I have video of that uh, on my phone. <laughs> I felt like such a tourist taking video of the PT in the morning, but uh, on our way to set. But actually, no, because it was so early that because our call time wasn't early enough to catch it when they were doing it. That when we were doing night shoots, oh, okay. we would be coming home as they were starting their day. Right. Um, and so then that's that was. I have a video of catching them when we were on the way back to our uh units and so yeah it was uh it was there were also the moments where we were we were told this ahead of time but it was such a cool experience seeing you know you know when you you stop your vehicle and and put your you know when when the uh uh at at five o'clock uh and and you'd hear it over the the radio speaker systems um you're talking about about reveille 
Uh, yes, yeah, yes. Okay. I can think of the name. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and and you hand over your heart and just wait, and then you keep going. It was it was a cool experience to see that happen. Uh, and and speaking of that, I my my sister who was in Texas and I got to visit her while I was there. Um, I she she's uh, engaged to a um, a man who served in Iraq, and I I talked to him and he said, yeah, when <laughs> when that would come on, he said it was so hot. And all you wanted to do was get inside some some sort of air conditioning or a fan. And then he would look at his watch and he'd see it's about time. He'd book it inside so he didn't have to stand outside and look at the fly. <laughs> and, uh, and, and he would tell me stories. It was funny. Hearing that was like, man, I mean, geez, even even in the military, you got to try to cut corners here and there uh, just like you would at any time. It was funny. So military is no exception no, man. When, it comes to, hey, when it comes to that. If you, if you ain't cheating, you ain't trying. That's all It's all yeah. you got to say about that, man. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, Absolutely. Hey, man, it's been awesome having you on, telling your story. I great really you, appreciate man. it. Love what you did. Um, looking forward to the Thank rest you. of the series coming out. Me too. And uh, <laughs> I'll let you know when, you're, when your episode uh, releases – I've got a, I've got a, several more interviews that I've got. My plan is to get as many interviews done uh, during the time the Long Road Home is releasing. So yeah. any, anybody Absolutely. else that you're in contact with uh, is is eager to get out and, and share their story with a bunch of uh, guys like me that were there <laughs> once upon a time um, on a podcast. I'd be more than happy to uh, to have them on the show. So. That's awesome. Yeah. All right, man. I will. I will uh, let cool. you go. I know you're a busy guy. You're probably uh, got some Call of Duty or something to go play. But um... <laughs> yeah, stuff like that. I don't, yeah. Where, where can cool. where can cool. people find more about you and kind of follow you on on social media? Yeah. Oh, you can find me on Facebook, on Twitter, uh, and on Instagram. All at the the same name. Uh, just my name. It's at Joey Luthman, which is spelled out would be J O E Y L U T H M A N. And that's on, again, that's on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. So all across the board. Very cool. That's what it is. Very yeah. cool. And it's even on, uh, on Skype. You're just, you know, you, Skype yeah, is you're not, a, I'm yeah, all you're all over the place. It's, it's very simple. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I was surprised. I came into the Instagram game kind of late. So I was surprised that I got. Uh, I mean, relatively late, uh, so, you know, a few years ago. But I, I was surprised I got my own name because a lot of my friends, you know, they have to say the official so and so or this person real or you know something like yeah. that shows that it's the real account with the check mark and everything. Right. But I, I was fortunate to get my own name, <laughs> so I'm pretty, I'm pretty bland, you know. I look at theirs; they've got all these fancy, you know, names and stuff, and I'm like, I'm just my own yeah. name. But uh, that's uh, very cool. But yeah. All right. Cool. Cool, man. Thank you so much, sir. I do appreciate it. Yeah. And, uh, yes. yeah, shoot him in the face. Shoot him in the face. Yeah. <laughs> All right, man. Thank yeah. you, man.